from the hearing for HB 1705 FNA. Allowing the purchase and use of marijuana by adults, regulating the purchase and use of marijuana, imposing taxes on the wholesale and retail sale of marijuana. Representative Cal, Cal Pratt, prime sponsor. Good morning. Uh, uh, yep, still morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and see members of the committee. Uh, for the uh, veterans who are still here, uh, you may recognize this bill as uh, the one that uh, was retained two years ago. That was 1652 FNA. Uh, 1705 FNA is almost identical to it. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of the interview two years, what's been happening in other states and the initiatives that the states are taking to make some corrections because primarily we're not seeing much out of the federal government, although at the present time, uh, Barney Frank and uh, Ron Paul have a bill in front of Congress which will return the, uh, will take the, the federal government out of this issue and put it back into the 50 states where we can all uh, experiment as Justice Brandeis had once said, you know, the 50 states of uh, democracy. So we can find out what's working. We do know that prohibition is a failed policy, it continues to be a failed policy, and yet it persists year after year after year without change. And that's why it is incumbent upon the states to make some, take some initiative in this matter. Uh, in 2010, three states, New Hampshire, California, and Washington State, all took initiatives in this direction. This year, it's two states, Colorado and New Hampshire. Uh, and it looks like uh, the good people of Colorado will have a chance to vote on their initiative. Uh, we want to push this forward primarily because the debate is starting to appear at the federal level where it needs to appear. The findings of this committee when, it was, when uh, the previous bill was retained two years ago, the primary stumbling block is what are we going to do about the feds? How can we deal with the feds? We're, I'm going to try to address that by simply going through the particulars of the bill and then allowing uh, all the other speakers uh, to address other issues. Um, if you have the bill in front of you, I'm going to go right to the, the first numbered page. <clears throat> the findings of the general court are all outlined there. Uh, there's one of them, the fifth one, that I'm going to come back to in my presentation later. Uh, if certain portions of this act are found to be inoperable and unconstitutional, it is the intent of the people of the state of New Hampshire to implement as much of this act as possible. So we have made the, uh, the act visible. Uh, if some parts don't work, other parts can be implemented. Our intent is to implement those parts that can be. And that, of course, is part of the federal response to the federal prohibition. Section 1, which starts on line 20 of that page, are simply the definitions of marijuana, marijuana paraphernalia, retailer, state prosecution, wholesaler, uh, as, as it pertains to this act. When you get down to page two, line nine, authorized activities are listed there, and of course any activity not in that section is still prohibited by law. The, the principal ones are uh, the age restriction. Anyone under the age of 21 cannot legally use marijuana possess marijuana paraphernalia and all of the prohibitions that are currently in place for all people will still remain in place for those 21 or under. It also addresses the wholesaler and retailers uh, abilities, what sort of licenses they will have and what they can do with those licenses. When you go down to line 26, uh, it begins to define exactly what a retailer is uh, the owner, employee, or agent of the retailer, and what sort of uh, privileges they have under this bill. Uh, and those are simply listed in uh, alphabetical order here. Anything not listed there remains prohibited. I can't stress that enough. This does not completely, across the board, legalize marijuana. There are still many prohibitions in place. The primary prohibition that we're attempting to lift now is for those who adults who are 21 years or older who are still plugging up part of our judicial and correctional system. On page three, line six, this is the section that deals with the wholesaler. In many parts of this bill, you will see repetition with only the word retailer removed and the word wholesaler put into place. Both have much the same restrictions and privileges under this act. 
And finally, when you get to the end of that page, it, it indicates what sort of uh, defenses are permissible uh, under this act for people who, who would otherwise be charged with a crime under the present prohibition. Moving on to page four. This is some, uh, still continues to define what is permissible, whereas when you get down to line uh, eight, it clearly defines what remains illegal. So there's no confusions about what you can and cannot do under this act. When you get down to line 25, there's a single line there uh, pertaining to uh, the rights of employers. And uh, to sum it up, basically, uh, an employer does not have to accommodate the use, possession, or being under the influence of marijuana for many of his employees in the place of employment. So the employer has full, full rights to, to restrict his employees in this bill. The next section, line 27, indicates the penalties for minors. It's defined as a misdemeanor, but later on in the bill you'll see that it's a misdemeanor <coughs> B. Uh, and, and the penalties there are, are limited. So this, this single line that simply said they will be guilty of a misdemeanor is then clarified further on in the bill. Uh, limitations on penalties are the next section, 318B, 26B, that's line 32. And then we get into the, uh, what I think is one of the more important aspects of this legislation, which is the taxation. How are we going to manage it if we're going to allow people 21 or older to uh, use marijuana? With your indulgence, may I have a sip of water? Because I'm already drying out. I've taken antihistamines today. Thank you. If you spill it, though, you have to clean it up. I have to clean it up. <laughs> <clears throat> um, at the end of page four, uh, is the beginning of the chapter, the taxation of marijuana, and I'll cover the particulars very quickly here. Uh, the department that's going to be overseeing uh, the revenue is the Department of Revenue Administration. Uh, when you go down to line 10, you get to part 77G2, in which it addresses uh, retailer licenses. Uh, further down on line 18, it sets the fee at $1,000 for the retailer's license. And it indicates in lines 20 to 22 that if the Department of Revenue fails to act in timely fashion, which is defined as 90 days under this act, anybody that holds a valid retail tobacco license uh, would then deem to be able to, to be a retailer under this license. When you get down to line 28, the wholesaler's license is, and as I discussed earlier, we're simply substituting much of the same language for retailer and we're taking out the word retailer and putting in the word wholesaler. The wholesale license is also $1,000. Uh, again, if the wholesaler has a valid uh, retail tobacco wholesale license and the department fails to act, act within the 90-day period of approval, they, they would also gain it. Uh, the qualified applicants are defined in the next section. It goes on in uh, page 6, line 10 through 16 to define the prohibition on licenses. When you go a little bit further down the bill, it, it, it defines what a retailer shall not be allowed to do under this act. Moving on to the next page, page seven. Uh, it indicates what, what sort of defenses are admissible in the case of someone who does sell, someone who's 21 years or younger. These are admissible defenses under the law. Uh, and they are detailed going down the line 12. Activities that are prohibited by a wholesaler, again, we have the repetition of much, much of what the retailer can't do, the wholesaler can't do. Uh, and that, that covers the bulk of page seven. Moving on to page eight, uh, we have the rate of taxation starting at line seven. Uh, the excise tax will be leveled on wholesalers at the rate of $45 per ounce, or proportionate thereof. The, the uh, retailers themselves will be taxed at the rate of 19% of the wholesale price for the product that they'll be selling. The next section, 77G8, defines the distribution of taxes under the Act. The first is to cover the entire cost of the administration of this chapter. Then the money that's remaining will go to the state treasurer and the general fund will receive 50% and Health and Human Services will receive 50% for their operating budget, 
for programs concerning the prevention and treatment of the abuse of alcohol and tobacco, marijuana, other controlled substances. Section 77G9 prohibits advertising. Section 77G10 concerns the transportation and a prohibition against bringing marijuana into the state from outside and the reverse, taking marijuana from the state out of the state, which still remains prohibited. <laughs> and Section 77G11, starting on line 26, is the administration rulemaking, uh, the uh, establishment and requirements for records that wholesalers and retailers need to keep, and what the responsibilities of the Department of Revenue are, and it goes down. And then finally we get at the bottom of page 9, line 35 is the severability clause that I referenced earlier, which basically says that if any provisions of this act or the application thereof, to any person, thing, or circumstance is held invalid, such invil invalidity will uh, uh, not affect the provisions or applications of this act, which can be given effect without the invalid provision or application. And to this end, the provisions of this act are declared to be severable. And then finally, you have the effective date. The fiscal note appears at the end. Um, when I introduced this bill two years ago, I gave you a great deal of information on what kind of savings could be attained under this bill. I referenced Jeffrey Meyer, a researcher at Harvard, for his research work. He's an economist. Uh, and he has since put out a, a new findings as of February uh, 2010. This is the most recent information. And in this, he finds that the amount of money spent in 2008, which is the most complete record he can compile, by the state of New Hampshire was $31.7 million. And that includes law enforcement, uh, judiciary and correction fees. The tax that he anticipates us being able to receive from this act would be in the vicinity of 9.27 million. That is, of course, speculative. I don't know if we can really rely upon the figure, but Professor Myron does seem to know what he's talking about. So when you take the two together, we're talking $40 million altogether. Specifically, the judicial branch stated that they would expect some savings because you would not be prosecuting people over the age of 21, provided they did not do anything that was in violation of any other portion of the act. So basically, you could purchase it, you could transport it at home, you could use it at home. If you use it in a public place, or even a place accessible to public, you're in violation of the act. Any transportation or transfer, even without remuneration to anyone under the age of 21, puts you in violation of the act. Any street sales, put you in violation of the act. Only wholesalers and retailers can trade. Any transport across state lines puts you in violation of the act. So there are still lots of prohibitions, which is why I hesitate to call it the legalization of marijuana, because there are, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can and cannot do. The finding of the judiciary, however, is uh, certain class A felonies for people over the age of 21 would no longer be a felony or a misdemeanor and, and many of the felonies for the larger crimes would no longer be felonies so consequently the judicial branch feels that there would be a, a savings. Uh, they couldn't, again you often get this in a bill, it's indeterminate exactly how much it would be because we have what we can see which is prohibition and what we can only speculate about which is you know this, this type of act. We don't know. When you go on to uh, other findings in the fiscal note, the uh, Association of Counties uh, expects to appreciate a savings from this act. Uh, at the present time, it takes them about $35,000 to incarcerate an individual. And again, if they're over the age of 21, that would no longer be necessary. Uh, when you go over to uh, further on in the fiscal note, uh, the Department of Revenue Administration states that there would be some increased uh, costs because they now have more expert uh, duties. But the specifics of this bill says the very first allocation of the money is going to go to cover the cost of administrating this bill. So that's basically a push for them. The Department of Justice states that they don't really anticipate receiving any, state, uh, any real savings from the bill because, and I'll, I'll read directly from the line, uh, they would be able to focus on marijuana-related crimes, which would be shifted to criminal activity involving other controlled drugs. 
which of course is what we want. We want them to focus on people 21 and under and the more serious kinds of drugs which are, are still a problem. And of course the Department of Corrections does expect to save money because they won't be incarcerating as many people. And that's what the bill does in a nutshell. Or maybe not so much in a nutshell. That was a long speech, but <laughs> happy to take any questions. Any, any questions, comments, Representative Gagney? Thank you my question. Uh, do you know right now how much, what the fee is for a retail beer license and a retail uh, and a wholesale beer license? To, only in certain areas because I have uh, funded a, uh, a bill for nano breweries last year and that sets their fee at I believe $240 but the next level up is $1,200 so this appears to be you know, in that ballpark figure it's midway between the nano brewery $240 license and the $1,200 license for a full tavern my question would be here, very simply, is why is the retail license for this and the wholesale license fee for this the same? Should not perhaps the wholesale <coughs> license be a bit more because they're handling more product? Um, I think the intent <coughs> is of keeping the cost level like this is so, because one of the intents wasn't spoken of in my presentation, but we do want to undercut the street price of marijuana and encourage people to purchase it legally and without any criminal threat or criminal penalty through the state's outlets. So in, in light of that, keeping those costs low, but not too low, uh, would be desirable. Uh, we know what the street price of really good pot goes for now, so we want to make sure that you know we can undercut that price. Thank you. Yeah, I have, I have really two quick questions, if I may. In the, in the bill, you've got prohibited activities on page 7. Any person around 21 years younger to be present on the premises. So are you saying that this stuff would be sold in the stores? So that means somebody 21 could go into the store because it would be on the premises where they're selling it? Um, there is, that's a very good question. There is a, uh, and I believe it's on this page, but I may have to do a little bit of searching for it, where it does actually indicate uh, who may not hold a license. Um, it's restricted. Ah, here it is. It's on page uh, 6, line 14 and 15. These are prohibitions on licenses. Number two is that is engaged in a business as a gas station, convenience store, grocery store, nightclub, dance hall, or licensed gambling establishment. Uh, prohibition one, probably, I, I shouldn't have glossed over this. You cannot locate one of these stores within 500 feet of the property line of a preschool, elementary school, junior high school, or high school, or structure that is primary, primarily for religious services or worship. And finally, prohibition three is that sells intoxicating liquor for consumption on or off the premises. Is that what you were alluding well, to? Well, I understand that. And then on page seven, you said that on the any premises. So if, if you say they allow 18-year-olds to go to a nightclub or, or not, I don't know. But how is the person... You're saying that the gas station convenience store can't sell it. In addition, this is, is this the section on wholesaler and representative? Well, what line is it's it? On, it's on page six and seven that you had, prohibition on licenses. And, then, and the other part of the question would have been at the same time, is how much can they buy at one time? Is there a limit on you walking in? How many can you buy? Are they packaged or what? Uh, you can buy anything up to one ounce, provided you don't already have, but I'm, I don't know if there's any way to enforce this, but you can go in and purchase one ounce at a single establishment at a time. Uh, any amount higher than one ounce is prohibited and will trigger, you know, it, it would be an exception to this bill. So one ounce is the most you can have for personal use. Um, 
the my understanding, I, I may have to look at this again, but my understanding was that anyone 21 years or younger was not allowed on the premises where this would be sold. So I was curious if, if you could point out the line that you were reading. Well, on page 7, on line 15, to, well, it goes down the page, 77 G6, perfect acting. Right, that, the wholesaler shall not, which is the line above that, line 15 and 16 then goes on to say, A, allow any person who is under 20 years of age to be present on the premises of its establishment. That's true for the wholesaler. And as I said before, a lot of this language is simply taken out. They take out wholesaler, they put in retailer, boom, the same prohibition applies. It, it, they try to keep it as straightforward as possible so there's no confusion about what you can or cannot do. If somebody comes on to your, your premises and they have a forged license or, or a counterfeit license that indicates they're 21, but the proprietor has any, any doubt as to whether or not this individual is actually 21, they must leave the premises. Because now, <laughs> The wholesaler, the retailer, I should say, is 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 liable if he doesn't get that that young person off his property. So, so, so who's going to sell it if you don't have any place that, particularly that you're going to buy it from? You're going to go somewhere to buy it, right? The intent of the bill was that anybody who holds a valid retail or wholesale tobacco license. <clears throat> can either apply for this license alone or can apply for a combination of tobacco and marijuana sales because those seem to be the establishments that would be most appropriate to sell it. I doubt people will be coming in and buying it prepackaged. They'll, they'll be buying it like they do pipe tobacco. Okay. Well, just to bring up a follow-up, is in Tilton, there is a tobacco store at one of the places. And they have other things in there like soda or candy and stuff. And if somebody under 21 and they're selling that, that means that the person under 21 can't go in the store. That's what you're saying in the bill. That's what I understand. That, that is correct, Representative. Is correct. So, so how are they going to, if that store, to some people, that store is the closest one for them. So where do they go? They've got to go outside of the realm to go to the store to buy their other goods. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, if that is the only establishment? Well, it is. I'm just saying if you get a small town, and that should be the only store up there. Like, say you go to Milan, I don't know how many stores they have, but I've only been to one store up there. And if those people that from that area don't want to go into Berlin to get something or, or some other place, Errol, how would they, you know, they're inconvenienced if they're under 21. So high school kids or kids that get out of school and want to go buy candy, all of a sudden they can't buy it. Where do they go? If that's the only store and they decide well, I don't know. To I'm just saying to you that that yeah. could be a possibility in the future. I, 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 would, I would say you're probably correct in that assessment. Uh, it's like any other property. If it's not available, it's not available. Uh, that would be my only response to that. Uh, we're not even sure how many people will actually apply for these licenses. Initially, there would be some concern. But uh, we try as, as best as possible within the provisions of this bill to make it available, but not too readily available, because we do have that prohibition about distances from religious institutions and high schools and so forth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on constant. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can't tell you too about you know that. <laughs> yeah, you've seen one of us just a week before. Same here. <laughs> Thank you. For That's enough for one day. It, it says in there in 2008 there were 840,000 arrests. How many were under 21? Do you know? I could, I could take a stab at answering that question, but I think there will be people af coming after me who will probably be much more um, informed, better informed on, the, on that subject. So if, if you don't mind, Representative, I'll, I'll take a pass on that one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th this provision in, on page three uh, that uh, uh, if a person passes a fake ID, um, it's an affirmative defense for selling to someone under 21. Do you happen to know, is there a similar provision to protect uh, dealers uh, with beer and alcohol in the law existing? Uh, no, I have an answer I don't. I know who does know. But <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's not me. I'm sorry. Okay. I see a problem with uh, not allowing the marijuana sales at a location that allows alcohol sales off premises. I realize the convenience stores are already out of the question, but if you go to a smoke shop, there's a good chance you're going to be able to buy beer or wine on the shelves. So you're going to exclude quite a few smoke shops by requiring them not to sell it if they sell alcohol for off premise use. So maybe just removing the uh, for off premises might be the solution to that. Uh, I didn't disagree with you. The model that was used for this legislation was for the state of Arizona, and there might be some particular issues that you know, brought up by other representatives that makes it a little less than totally appropriate for New Hampshire. So if, you, if the committee decided that they wanted to amend some portions to make it more applicable to this state, yeah, I, have, I have no problems with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Representative Tim Comerford. I represent Rockingham District 9, which is Epping and Fremont. And I just come today to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Constitution as it regards to uh, this matter, because I seem that uh, most of the opposition that you seem to get for, from members of the law enforcement community seems to be with regard to federal law. And I would state that the U.S. Constitution under the Tenth Amendment uh, delegates those, those powers that aren't directly delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states or the people. In Article 7 of the state constitution, it says that the people of the state have the sole and exclusive right of governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state and do and forever hereafter shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right pertaining thereto, which is not or may not hereafter be by them expressly delegated to the United States of America and Congress assembled. And under the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, the only crimes mentioned that are punishable by the federal government are treason, piracy, and violations of the laws of nations, which is international law. Marijuana is not, has nothing to do with violating a treaty, isn't treason and isn't piracy. It's not listed in the Constitution, so therefore they have no authority to enforce anything that's relative there too. And Madison said on the Commerce Clause that it is very certain that it grew out of the abuse of power by the importing states in taxing the non-importing and was intended as a negative and preventative provision against injustice among them states themselves and not as a power to be used for positive purposes of the general government. So what the Commerce Clause was intended to do was prevent states from blocking trade with each other, not giving the federal government an authority it never had in the Constitution. And even up until the 18th Amendment in 1919, that the Congress understood that they had no authority to pass the Volstead Act that outlawed the production and consumption of alcohol, unless and until they passed the Constitutional Amendment granting them the authority to do so, and they did that because clearly they understood that they did not already have that authority under the Commerce Clause. Now in comes the packed court of Roosevelt that was put in with the statist ideology that the court ruled in Wickard v. Filburn that wheat consumed on the grower's own farm for personal use could, not, uh, could be interstate commerce. There was a farmer, uh, I believe it was in Illinois during the Great Depression, who was growing wheat for his own personal use. And they called it interstate commerce because they, they supposed that it affected the price of wheat, even though he wasn't actually A, involved in commerce, or B, purchasing a thing. So Wickard v. Filburn, which is repugnant on its face to the U.S. Constitution, stated that wheat consumed on his own farm for personal use, it could not legitimately be interstate commerce. It's explicitly intrastate, as it never left the state and was certainly not direct commerce, as nothing of monetary value was ever exchanged. And the Supreme Court erred in their decision because they failed to consult the history of the Founders' views on the Commerce Clause and the need for the 18th Amendment to allow for the aforementioned Volstead Act. If you didn't have the power before that amendment, why would you have it now? And what we had in that court also ruled that it was perfectly legitimate to place Japanese Americans into internment camps when the enemy we were fighting felt it was okay to do so as well. So if that court could also rule something <coughs> such as that, I don't see how their opinion could be valid with respect to something like uh, like the Interstate Commerce Clause. 
But due to stare decisis and principles of precedence, one bad decision compounds the next, and the court ruled similarly in Gonzales v. Rach that marijuana was interstate commerce, even though there is no legitimate market for it as it stands. But Justice Thomas, O'Connor, and Rehnquist dissented, the strongest so being that of Justice Thomas. And his view was that the respondent's local cultivation and consumption of marijuana is not commerce among the several states. Certainly no evidence from the founding suggests that commerce included mere possession of a good or some personal activity that did not involve trade or exchange for value. In the early days of the Republic, it would have been unthinkable that Congress could prohibit the local cultivation, possession, and consumption of marijuana. If the federal government can regulate growing a half dozen <coughs> cannabis plants for personal consumption, not because it is interstate commerce, but because it is inextricably bound up with interstate commerce, then Congress's Article I powers, as expanded by the Necessary and Proper Clause, have no meaningful limits whatsoever. Whether Congress aims at the possession of drugs, guns, or any number of other items, it may continue to appropriate state police powers under the guise of regulating commerce. And further, if the majority is to be taken seriously, the majority of the court, that being, the federal government may now regulate quilting bees, clothes, drives, and potluck suppers throughout the 50 states. This makes a mockery of Madison's assurance to the people of New York that the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined, while those of the states are numerous and indefinite. And the reason why the federal government has gotten so out of control over the years is that state legislators have been in dereliction of duty. We have failed in what Madison described as our, our interpository role, that is to stand between the federal <coughs> government and the rights of the people. It is the duty of the state legislators to push back against any unconstitutional <coughs> attempt by the federal government to seize power. This is not their area for regulation, and it is for us to push back and declare these rulings to be repugnant to the Constitution and invalidate them. Thank you very much. Representative Kuruby. Yes, uh, you keep mentioning the Constitution. Uh, is that a document that's a working document, you believe? I don't hold that view. That's the view of broad constructionist. I label myself a strict constructionist. I view the Constitution as a document that should be interpreted from both historical record and what the founders thought it meant at the time. Because otherwise, the government itself and not the document becomes the limit of their powers. A follow up for me? Uh, yeah, well, you believe the reason I asked that question is that it wasn't that many years ago that the woman could not vote in that country. Uh, was that a constitution? If you were Catholic, you could not be elected to office. That was part of it, wasn't it? That was never part of the U.S. Constitution. The, the, rest, the reference to Protestantism that you're you seem to be referring to was in the New Hampshire Constitution, but it was stricken. Oh. But I, the amendment process is uh, the appropriate place to address something such as woman suffrage, and we did, rightly so. One other, the, I guess, uh, black people were allowed to vote in this country, too. Well, that was addressed with the 14th Amendment. You might argue that... So it changed. It can change, but there's a process to change it. But you might argue that uh, the civil, the Fourteenth Amendment wasn't necessarily necessary because the Constitution already protected all men as created equal, and the Southern states were just ignoring it. But that's Thank neither you, here Madam nor Chair. there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative, would you believe that uh, possession or sale of less than one ounce of marijuana, first offense? classified as a felony in the state of New Hampshire. Three years in jail, up to $25,000 fine. Uh, would you mind indulging the committee with article, the first line of Article 18? I would uh, very much enjoy indulging with that, because that was actually on my list of points to make. Article 18. Discussing the merits of the bill. Yes. Article 18. Well, with, with, due, respect, with, with due respect, Madam Chair, uh, the question that your member raised has absolutely everything to do with the bill because it's talking about penalties that we have under the current law. And the article of the Constitution is actually relevant. It's, it says that penalties to proportion offenses, that all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense, and no wise legislature will affix the same punishment to the crimes of theft, forgery, and the like, which they do to those of murder and treason. 
So what it's, it's saying is that the Constitution or is that in the bill? That's Article 18 of the Constitution. That's Article 18 of the Constitution, which relates to the fact that the current laws we have on marijuana are are in order to their, their, the punishment does not fit the crime. It's too high. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Could you leave that sheet with me for the practice, please? I would, I, testimony? I would be happy to. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative uh, ja uh, Jasper. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. I am Representative Sean Jasper, Hillsborough 27, and I appear before you in opposition to the bill representing uh, the majority office. Heard some, some interesting things. I'm sorry I wasn't here for all of the testimony, but I think I understand the gist of it. And while I agree with many of the points that are made relative to the Congress overreaching its powers, this is not the way for us to um, go after that issue. Uh, we've, we've heard court cases which, from the Supreme Court, would certainly seem to uh, say that the courts have determined that regulating drugs is something that Congress can do. So for us to pass a bill that flies in the face of not only the federal law, but the ruling of the Supreme Court would not be a wise decision on our part. Um, we need to go, if we want to go after these issues, we need to go after them a different way. And it is not for one state, it, as the Constitution talks about, it is for the states to actually band together and push these issues. If we act as 50 individual states going after the federal government, we are going to get nowhere. We need to find issues where we can have common agreement and, and act upon those. Uh, under the Federal Drug Act, Section 841, uh, it is a pro pro prohibited act to distribute, uh, dispense, or possess with the intent to distribute or disperse marijuana. And so even if the state of New Hampshire decides that there are issues, and we have several bills dealing with um, homegrown products and manufactured products. If there was a desire to go there, let's use a vehicle that isn't bound up in, in the issue of drugs. You know, we can talk about whether marijuana is worse than alcohol or anything else, but neither one of them is really a, a product that has a great deal of benefit on society and certainly not on, on young people. So for us to make this our line in the sand and make a constitutional issue out of it, uh, I don't think put New, puts New Hampshire in a very good light. Um, so I would encourage you to carefully look at the ramifications. I understand this bill is severable, but ultimately that would just leave us in a situation where if you were over 21, um, you could possess marijuana. If we want to do that, I think we need to go at it a different way, not telling people we're going to pass this law which taxes and sets up the safeguards that we need, but end up with nothing more than a bill that just says, hey, it's perfectly legal to uh, possess marijuana if you're over 21. Don't really think that's the way, way we want to go. So I, I understand the issues and the constitutional issues are important ones. I really don't think they ought to be <laughs> this particular piece of legislation because I, I don't think it serves to state well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question, President Jasper. Um, is the majority office aware that this is only under one ounce or under of marijuana? That is only one ounce or under for possession not for manufacturer growing distribution. Yes, we're well, well aware of that. Okay. My question, although we have this stuff going on in California and wherever else it is, the federal government could still come in and say to these people that we've sold as a state a license to 
eh, come with me. Yeah, I haven't followed very closely what's going on in California. That is under the whole guise of medical marijuana and the uses there. And, and it, this is much, much broader. Um, and the, certainly the feds in California do have, have, in my opinion, based on the law, um, <coughs> the ability to go in and shut down all those places. But we're, we're going in a whole different direction and a whole different territory than what is covered in California. Well, that's why I'm asking, because they've got the, the shield of, well, it's medical, and we're not doing that, we're just putting it out there as it's under an arm. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I know that you have a long list of people to hear from today, so I hope, hopefully I'll be very quick. Um, I would like to say that this is a simple question and there are simple answers. The fact is that we have a lot of people from law enforcement who are going to sit here and tell you why it's a bad thing. Uh, and I remember uh, that um, when we had prohibition, we had law enforcement officials who were going out and ready to enforce prohibition laws. This particular bill, uh, and when, when they actually looked at that, when we actually changed it um, and removed prohibition, all of a sudden the law enforcement officials have moved over to regulation. They've done a good job. We have a department in the state that goes out and instead of fighting a war on alcohol possession, regulates it. And you know we have police officers now who make sure bars are in compliance. We have our own state liquor stores. Okay, Time changes laws and public perception change. I was stunned the first time that I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that said public opinion is over 70% in favor of getting rid of the prohibitions on uh, marijuana in this country. When you ask people on the street in a live poll what the numbers are, the numbers are actually lower than when you actually let them walk into a ballot box and make the decision. If we were to put this to the people, we wouldn't be having this conversation because the statistics are people who are coming out to vote are more in favor of it than they're willing to answer in a survey because people, you know, it's one of those really contentious issues. This is a bill that attempts to go out and solve some of the problems. I was going to tell you about all of the constitutional reasons why you should support it. That's already been covered. I'd like to tell you why um, it would both increase revenue from a licensing and sales perspective and reduce our cost for criminal, in criminal justice enforcement and incarceration, you know, that's already pretty clear. What we have is a solution to um, find a balance in the law. Now, the, the outstanding question is what are we going to do with the federal government? And if they weren't sending mixed <coughs> messages, you know, maybe I would have a different position. But right now, if you are in a VA hospital in a state that has medical marijuana provisions, the federal government says, you know, you can actually have medical marijuana in a VA hospital. I mean, where are we on this? If you look at the history of how we got a marijuana prohibition in the first place, it was because large chemical companies didn't want um, agricultural hemp and other things impacting their business after, um, you know, in the wars and the, uh, the oils and other products that were available. This was an attempt to actually go and suppress business and commerce, and it's turned into something completely different. We need to focus on their, <coughs> our ready customers, ready market, and those customers are being turned into criminals, even though the public will is to the contrary. If the public will was, most people don't want this, I would have a different position. But my constituents have told me I need to be up here and support this because we need to fix the problem. If New Hampshire has an opportunity to demonstrate that the live for your die state is willing to get out in front and solve these problems and do what our constituents have said they want us to do. This is a great opportunity to pass this out of committee and let's send it let's send it to the House floor for a vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, honorable committee members. The 
previous speakers said a lot of what I was going to say, but I wanted to focus in on the fact that Part 1, Article 18 of the New Hampshire Constitution, you know, where, where it says that all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense, I wanted to point out that when punishment does not fit the crime, as it does not in our current laws regarding marijuana, it breeds disrespect for the law. So there's more at stake here than just, um, you know, whether or not we can have less than an ounce of marijuana. Uh, we also want to be concerned about whether or not the people are respecting the law. Also, um, Representative Jasper brought up the fact that this could be in conflict with federal law, but I just wanted to point out again that the bill says that if certain portions of this act are found to be inoperable or unconstitutional, it is the intent of the people of the state of New Hampshire to implement as much of the act as possible. So you, it is divisible. Also, uh, Representative Jasper said that marijuana really isn't a very important issue, and I beg to differ with him. Um, more and more studies are coming out, you know, showing that marijuana has significant medical benefits and even protective and immune boosting benefits. And like I currently use herbs, you know, to try to maintain my immune system. And if you know I wanted to use the essential oil from a marijuana plant, it just does not seem right to me that our current laws as they are now, they, they are telling me I cannot do that. Also, even though the, the federal uh, level has the ability to come into the state and try to um, counterdict what this would, law would do, doesn't mean that they will do that. Like Representative Lambert said that, you know, we're getting mixed messages from the federal government. Representative uh, Taro um, asked me to mention to you, because he couldn't come in and testify himself, that he saw on C-SPAN a few months ago a DEA agent who actually said we should decriminalize marijuana for two reasons. Number one, it would defund the drug cartels, because most of your drug cartels, 75% or more of their profits comes from the sale of marijuana. And the other thing that it would do is it would lower all the overall drug use because right now with the way the laws are, people see their use of marijuana as a criminal activity. And so they think of themselves as criminals. And so they're not as, um, they don't have so much of a problem going on into other criminal activities such as harder drugs. But if you break that connection and people stop seeing themselves as criminals for using a small amount of marijuana, then they no longer want to go on and, and do other criminal acts. So that was the testimony of the DE agent, DEA agent. And um, all I want to say is that I think that HB 1705 is a well thought out bill that makes sense for New Hampshire. And I would appreciate it if you would support it with an ought to pass recommendation. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Richard Van Winkler. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Committee. My name is Richard Van Winkler. I'm a long life resident of New Hampshire and have served the last 24 years in law enforcement and continue to do so as the superintendent of the Cheshire County Department of Corrections. I do not represent Cheshire County here today. I've taken a vacation day to be here in order to testify as a member of law enforcement against prohibition. LEAP is a nonprofit organization consisting of law enforcement officers, judges, corrections professionals, and others who oppose the current war on drugs policy. House Bill 1705 is smart and responsible legislation, and I speak in favor of this bill. To begin my testimony, I want it to be very clear that I do not advocate the use of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, or any non-prescribed drug. This discussion and this bill is about our drug policy and the effects of that policy. And considering drug policy in our state and in our nation, we have to ask ourselves the following questions. Is what we are doing effective toward creating a drug-free society? 
because that's what the stated mission of the current drug war is. Has crime been reduced because of our current policies? Are we safer as a community because of our current policies? Are the costs of incarceration and the surveillance justified? Criminal justice policy should be about promoting public safety and it should be about preventing crime. Our current policies do not achieve this. In my study of drug war policy, I utilized government produced data that was funded by our tax dollars and also reputable research from widely accepted sources to reach my conclusion. As for a policy that protects our citizens, consider that each year in the United States alone, tobacco kills 435,000 people. Poor diet and physical inactivity kill 365,000 people. The illicit use of illegal drugs kills 17,000 people, and the use of marijuana has not killed one single person. The Drug Enforcement Agency has indicated that 75% of the gang war violence is over illegal drug marketplace disputes. The violence associated with drug use in our country is not because of the substance. It's because of the prohibition of those substances. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country. We have 5% of the world's population, and we have 25% of the world's inmates. We now have 2.7 million people behind bars. We have over 7 million people in our correctional system. Consider that 114 million Americans have admitted to using an illegal drug in their lifetime, and 34 million have admitted to using in the last 12 months. The majority of users, by far, is for the use of marijuana. Taking this into consideration, and assuming that we can arrest our way out of this, then we must increase our national jail bed space from 2.4 million jail beds to at least 35 million jail beds. Unfortunately, our current correctional system has become one we can no longer afford. A vote in favor of this bill. It is a vote to end discrimination against harmless people. It is a vote to put illegal drug dealers out of business. It is a vote to reduce crime. It is a vote to increase public safety. It is a vote to more wisely spend criminal justice resources. It's also a vote that will earn revenue that is fair and widely accepted among your constituency. It's a vote that is responsible and smart, and it's based on solid evidence. It's a vote that will greatly assist in keeping it out of the hands of minors because it is regulated and controlled and more difficult for them to access. A vote in favor of this bill does not do the following. It does not endorse the use of drugs any more than we currently endorse the use of alcohol or tobacco. It will not increase the use of drugs by individuals who currently have no desire to use it. Retired Judge James Gray of Orange County, California, said that in his 30 years behind the bench on the front lines of this issue has convinced him that our approach is not working and that our marijuana policy has to change in order to achieve the following goals. Reduce marijuana consumption by children. Stop or reduce the violence and corruption that accompanies the growing and distribution of marijuana. Stop or reduce crime, both by people trying to get money to purchase marijuana and by those that are under its influence. Reduce the harm to people who consume marijuana and reduce the number of people we have to put into our jails and our prisons. Latest polls show that 76% of the constituency and 67% of our nation's police chiefs agree with this. Opponents of this bill will tell you, they'll bring up the issue of the gateway theory. There's no study or research ever produced that anyone can cite that will support this. In fact, all studies conducted reveal that the opposite is true. There is no connection. That excuse was first used before Congress in 1937, and it's fascinating that law enforcement officials will still use this testimony to support current drug prohibition laws. Opponents of ending the drug war will testify that if marijuana is legalized, that it will be more readily available. The facts are that marijuana is readily available everywhere in the United States right now. It is so available that our children can buy it in unlimited supply in our schools. 
which is why pa passage of this legislation is so essential. School children report annually that obtaining illegal drugs is far easier than accessing alcohol or tobacco. Regulating where this substance is and who can access it is currently what we do not have in our existing policies. This legislation seeks to correct that problem. Opponents of this legislation will tell you that the rate of use among minors will increase if marijuana is legalized. The <coughs> facts are overwhelming that everywhere in this country and around the world where prohibition is eased, the use of the substance goes down, especially with minors. Some law enforcement officers will suggest to you that if this legislation passes, more people will drive under the influence of it. This is preposterous because it assumes that laws dictate behavior. If laws did in fact dictate behavior, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. And of course, once again, there's no evidence to support that claim. Opponents of this bill will say, what kind of a message are we going to be sending to our children if we pass this bill? The current message that we send to our children is this. First, we know that marijuana is widely available to you and that there's a very good chance that you're going to be in its presence and pressured by peers to use it. We don't know who is selling it to you or your peers or what it might be tainted with. The sellers certainly don't care who you are, and we know that. We know that the unlimited supply of marijuana in America is not going to end. We know that the 6,000% markup on this widely used product funds terrorism. The current message to our children is that we've known these facts for 40 years and simply do not know or we do not care what to do about it. In the interest of time, I won't go on with the endless list of unsubstantiated reasons that opponents will give. I'll tell you that there is no evidence to support the claims that a lot of them will make. In summary, our country will spend this year approximately $88 billion in yet another attempt to create a drug-free society, and it's going to fail. When we incarcerate a rapist, a bank robber, or any other mal -inse criminal, the crimes that they were committing stop. Hence the incapacitation effect of incarceration. When we incarcerate an illegal drug dealer, we simply create a job opportunity for another opportunist who will step in and keep the illegal supply and unregulated revenue stream coming in. Most disturbing to me as a citizen and as a taxpayer is that there is no other crime, not domestic violence, not sexual assault, not public corruption, or any violent crime that we pursue with the endless stream of financial and human resources that we commit to fighting the use of illegal drugs. Our policies on drugs should seek to reduce death, disease, crime, and addiction. Our current policies achieve none of these goals. This legislation goes a long way toward reducing all of the current harms associated with prohibition. Please consider the facts, and please honor the evidence. As a voter, I'm hopeful that anyone, be it the House, the Senate, the Governor, anybody who's in opposition to this bill would do the responsible thing and provide solid and sound reasoning for his or her actions. To just say no is ineffective and irresponsible to the citizens of New Hampshire. This is responsible legislation, and I encourage its passage. Thank you for the privilege to testify before you today. Any questions for this witness? Professor Ginsburg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, what's the evidence for the idea that uh, uh, marijuana or illegal drugs are easier to get for uh, underage uh, people than beer? There are. I'm sorry, sir. There are polls that are done annually in schools uh, to determine the availability of drugs in those schools in order to give us greater intelligence about how much illegal substance are in our schools. There was a press release done this week, I want to say it was uh, perhaps Monday or Tuesday, that said one in three New Hampshire high school students use marijuana. One in three. The other good news about that survey was that New Hampshire has the lowest dropout rate. But the fact is alarming that children have access, unlimited access, to illegal drugs, and they testify year after year after year that it's far easier to get illegal drugs than it is alcohol or tobacco because those substances are regulated. Thank you. Uh, can you answer my question about how many um, 
people under 21 were arrested in that um, 840 in 2008. No, sir, I can't. Is, it, may I make a general point? Is there anyone that can? Ruby, that's federal, too, so it's not really... Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the answer is he doesn't know. Okay. Thank you. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was interested in that figure as well. Would, would you have any idea about comparable figures for New Hampshire? No, sir. I would suggest contacting the Attorney General's office to see what they have available. Although I will tell you, based on my experience in trying to get data from New Hampshire, it's not something we're good at. We don't good at data. We're not good at data collection. It's something we need to improve in this state. Thank you. Any other questions to this witness? <coughs> None. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have copies. I'll send them forward. Thank you. Well, that's coming down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, for the record, my name is Representative Mark Warden, representing Hillsborough County District 7, which are the towns of Gotchtown and Ware. And first of all, I just want to make a disclaimer that as a uh, fiscally conservative Republican, I don't smoke marijuana. If this bill were to pass, or when it does pass, I'm not going to start smoking marijuana. But I will admit to enjoying <coughs> occasional beer, frosty beer, and in fact, I've even stopped on occasion at the state-run liquor store to purchase a bottle of wine. So, I'm here really in the interest of taxpayers and for the humanity of the criminal justice system <coughs> more than anything. And understanding that uh, from a fiscal sense, the cost to society and to taxpayers of uh, the revolving door of the criminal justice system with these uh, sort of non-violent crimes is one that we should do, that the legislature, we should uh, work towards improving. First of all, I'm only, I'll keep my comments brief and uh, let some other people uh, give some good testimony, but here are five simple words to remember. Marijuana is safer than alcohol. We all know this, right? It's, it's almost self-evident. We hear testimony all the time from, <coughs> there's a book here, there you go, thank you. There's a, we hear testimony all the time. Uh, to that effect, but all sorts of substances, including Tylenol, prescription drugs, alcohol, even water, are lethal and have killed people from overuse. There's never been a recorded case of somebody dying from smoking <coughs> too, much, too much marijuana. Never. Um, although liquor is far more dangerous, the state treats treats alcohol as if we're as if it were safer than marijuana, right? Which encourages more people to drink. And obviously, everybody knows that legal tobacco cigarettes uh, and smoking leads to horrible health outcomes, often, and deaths for thousands each year. Um, also, we know that alcohol leads to violent and aggressive behavior. So uh, we hear that sort of testimony from, the, from law enforcement. And I think if uh, law enforcement police were truly interested in public safety and the safety of officers, they would be encouraging prohibition on alcohol and not on marijuana. Second takeaway on this is that marijuana, uh, there's a myth out there that it's a gateway drug to use, using higher, uh, worse drugs like cocaine and heroin. No such evidence exists. In fact, uh, as far back as 1999, the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences um, wrote, quote, because underage smoking and alcohol use typically precede marijuana use, marijuana is not the most common and is rarely the first gateway to illicit drug use. There is no conclusive evidence that the drug effects of marijuana are causally linked to the subsequent abuse of other illicit drugs, unquote. So that's a red herring argument, and I think we can dispatch with that. Um, I'll just leave you with this, I think this is a very important point, that law enforcement, the criminal justice uh, system, and all taxpayers will benefit by passing this legislation. I'm glad to take questions if you have any, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Tasker? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, do you believe that allowing those 21 years <coughs> older to use marijuana will send the wrong message to children? 
Thank you for the question, Representative. I'm not sure what the wrong message to send is. If you're saying that it puts it on, uh, it lets people think that it says safe or as dangerous as alcohol and tobacco, yeah, maybe it is the wrong message. Because I think for many people, marijuana is far safer than alcohol use. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for testimony. Thank you. And with the Chair's permission, may I return to my seat, but I won't ask any questions of testifiers? Thank you. I've already turned in uh, the testimony, the testimony for the clerk. Uh, Baron Eckel from the Attorney General's Office. I don't know this afternoon. Good, up, good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify <coughs> on this bill. Um, my name is Karen Eckel. I'm an Assistant Attorney General uh, at the, in the Criminal Justice Bureau Office of the Attorney General, and I appear on behalf of the Attorney General who opposes this bill. Um, you've been asked to consider the facts. Well, the fact, um, an important fact remains that, <coughs> that under federal law, the legal status of marijuana hasn't changed. And I, I don't think anyone disagrees that the activity that's contemplated uh, in this bill is uh, considered illegal uh, under the eyes of the federal, in the eyes of the federal government. Um, in late 2011, uh, the Department of Justice issued uh, a letter to several state attorneys general, uh, including our own, indicating that their position is that they will, they will enforce the laws against individuals uh, and organizations, state employees, who participate in the business of manufacturing and distributing uh, marijuana, even if it's permissible under state law. There's not, this is not a mixed message. This is a clear directive to federal prosecutors. By enacting this bill, this legislature uh, would be giving individuals in our state the false assurance that they will be immune from criminal liability for their activities under the law and essentially also force state employees to violate federal law. These are, this is an important fact and uh, it is the reason that the Attorney General opposes uh, this legislation. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Representative Briazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Eckel, how much money does your department currently spend on enforcing drug laws in the state of New Hampshire? I do not have that information. I'm a prosecutor. Can you get that for us? I'm, I'm sorry? Can you get that for us? Specifically, you want to know how much our office spends? How much do you spend on prosecuting drug cases in the state of New I'll see if I can get that information for you. Follow. If it exists. <laughs> Can you tell me how many times federal prosecution has taken place in the state of New Hampshire with relation to drug crime? Um, I don't track that, but I know that it does happen. Absolutely. Get that number too. The number of federal prosecutions Please. for drug crimes. Please. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. David Goldstein. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is David Goldstein, and I'm the Chief of Police in the City of Franklin. I've been a law enforcement officer for 32 plus years, and I'm here today to voice the strong opposition to House Bill 1705 for the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police. Throughout the years, as well as this year, the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police, a professional organization representing over 230 chief executive law enforcement officers from local, county, and state levels of government, has strongly opposed similar proposals. For over 55 years, our organization has diligently worked to ensure that New Hampshire retains its positive quality of life. This bill will have dangerous consequences for our children, whether we want to believe that or not, in light of this hearing as well as for the community. Our communities look to all of us to enact laws that will protect us and guarantee that way of life that we've come to enjoy. This legislation does just the opposite. At a time when reports show that teenage marijuana use is increasing, we are discussing decriminalizing marijuana. And we ask now, what is the message that we're going to send to our children? Is that message is that it is okay to use 
and uh, consume marijuana. In point of fact, would any of you go on television tonight and say just that? We do know that marijuana is dangerous, in fact. We know that there are health risks associated with its use. Drug legalization advocates in the United States single out marijuana as a different kind of drug, unlike cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, and therefore say it's less dangerous. This is not necessarily so. Marijuana is far more powerful today than it was uh, in the past. The active ingredient, THC, has increased over the years. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, studies show, and I quote, that someone who smokes five joints per week may be taking in as many cancer-causing chemicals as someone who smokes a full pack of cigarettes per day. Short-term effects of marijuana are also harmful. They include memory loss, <coughs> excuse me, distorted perception, trouble with thinking and problem solving, loss of motor skills, decrease in muscle strength, impact uh, mental development on young people, and inability to concentrate in school, and a decrease in motiv motivation and initiative to achieve goals. Many of these are social consequences as well. There is medical marijuana already available, even though that's not per se discussed today, and that's called marijuana. A comprehensive review of studies of marijuana was conducted by the Institute of Medicine, the only organization charted by the National Academy of Sciences, and the report that was referenced to earlier re released in 1999. The Institute, in fact, did not recommend the use of smoking marijuana. Legalization of drugs <clears throat> will lead to increased use and increased levels of addiction. Legalization has been tried before and failed miserably. By way of example, I'll take you back to 1975. The state of Alaska, the Supreme Court ruled that the state could not interfere with an adult's possession of marijuana for personal consumption in the home. The court's ruling became a green light for marijuana use. Although the ruling was limited to persons 19 and over, Teens were among those increasingly used marijuana at that time. According to a 1988 University of Alaska study, the state's 12 to 17 year olds used marijuana more than twice the national average for their age group. In 1990, Alaska's residents voted to recriminalize possession of marijuana for these reasons. This demonstrated their belief that the increased use was too high a price to pay. By 1979, after 11 states had decriminalized marijuana, and the Carter administration had considered federal decriminalization marijuana use shot up among teenagers appreciably. That year, almost 51% of 12th graders reported that they used marijuana in the last 12 months. <coughs> Excuse me. By 1992, with tougher laws and increased attention, the risks of drug abuse that figure has been reduced, had been reduced to 22%, a 57% decline. <coughs> As for the alcohol issue, according to Dr. Mitchell Rosenthal, director of Phoenix House, only 10% of drinkers become alcoholics, while up to 75% of regular illicit drug users become addicted. Is this, in fact, how we want to also increase revenue? Is this the path that we want to travel? Last year, this body, our body, the Chiefs, fought to protect the citizens of our state by not allowing people to smoke tobacco in public facilities, and, this, and the legislature agreed. I want to implore you seriously to consider the effects that this will have in the years to come on our children and our way of life. Ten years from now, are these are the laws that we want to be responsible for creating. Ten years from now, what will be the next drug to legalize? Please vote this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Tasker? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the position of the uh, Chiefs of Police Association that alcohol is a safer alternative than marijuana? No. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Chief, how much money does your department spend on uh, arresting drug offenders? I don't know. Can we get that information? I can try. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. You're Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is David Parento. I'm a captain of the State Police. I'm in charge of the Investigative Services Bureau, uh, which investigates uh, all crimes uh, within the State Police jurisdiction. Uh, I'm here to uh, put forward the position of the Department of Safety on behalf of Commissioner Balthamus and Assistant Commissioner Earl Sweeney. Um, 
I'll just summarize. Um, I do have a packet of the position papers here, but I'll just simply summarize a few points. Uh, Department of Safety strongly opposes this bill. We believe it is bad policy, public policy, and will create more problems than it solves. And not to reiterate what uh, other speakers have said, um, if this bill does pass, marijuana possession would still be illegal under federal law. In the Supreme Court case of Ashcroft v. Raich, people that use marijuana can be prosecuted under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, even if they are using it pursuant to a doctor's prescription and such usage is legal under state law. As others have said, therefore, this bill creates a situation where a person is allowed to do something under state law that would make him or her a criminal under federal law. Secondly, based on the experience of other states, as the prior speaker has alluded to, the state of Alaska being the prime example, uh, in addition to the issues that, that were described, this law will create a booming business in the production distribution of the drug and it will become highly competitive marketplace. Marijuana producers will try and see who can produce the most potent crop and advertise it as such. THC, the main ingredient of marijuana, varies greatly from one producer to another. Adults will legally have marijuana in their houses where their teenage sons and daughters may have access to it, to pilfer, use it, and sell it to their friends. There are significant problems on our highways as it is with drivers misusing other prescription drugs, driving under the influence of those drugs, and getting into crashes. Legalizing marijuana in this regard would provide yet another danger on the state highways. The bill states in the finding of the general court that because decades of arresting millions of marijuana users has failed to prevent teenagers or anyone else from using marijuana, the state should take a new approach by strictly regulating marijuana with a goal of reducing teenage access to marijuana. However, by legalizing the marijuana used by adults and imposing taxes on the wholesale and retail sale, this bill fails to address how such measures would reduce teenage access to marijuana. Experience tells us that the regulation of cigarettes has not reduced its access to teenagers, Therefore, it is unlikely that legalizing marijuana would do anything different. This is an extremely troubling bill that runs the risk of changing the face of New Hampshire and not for the better. The New Hampshire Department of Safety strongly opposes this bill for the reasons stated. Thank you. Any questions in this case? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Do you have a copy? Yes, sir, I will. <coughs> <please. laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm Chris Dornan, Chairman of Citizens for Criminal Justice Reform. We strongly support the legislation. Thank you. Uh, for, and I can't give you any original things in, in, in the arguments for it that you haven't already heard from people that are much better prepared than I am. Uh, the big issue is the money that you can save by not incarcerating people for drugs, and the money you can keep out of the hands of uh, professional illegal drug salesmen now in their violence. That's a huge opportunity. You should head towards that policy direction. Maybe it's premature to do it this year because of the federal uh, conflict and laws and the way you'd be setting up our people to get prosecuted by the feds. Uh, the Attorney General's office does have a point, and I'm not entirely persuaded by the constitutional arguments. Uh, there have been too many court precedents basically federalizing wars on crime. I don't think the federal role should have nearly as big a role as it does in fighting crime. I'm deeply concerned about that, and I'd like to see that reversed. I don't know if this bill is the mechanism for doing that. Uh, if you folks and, and the people behind me who strongly support this bill, I don't mean to be disloyal to them. If the best you can get this year is a resolution from New Hampshire saying the criminalization of marijuana is a terrible policy, 
and we think the feds should get out of that business, that would be a strong positive to send them. It might help uh, affect policy at the federal level. Uh, we are the tail trying to wag the dog there. I recognize that. Any questions in this way? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, we could be ahead of time. Greg Polowski. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for hearing me. My name is Greg Polanski and I am a New Hampshire resident. I live in Manchester and I appreciate this opportunity for today to discuss with you a third rail subject, drug reform. Today I ask you, the Honorable, Honorable and Intelligent State Representatives of New Hampshire, to take your place in New Hampshire history books, to protect New Hampshire from a power that does not listen to its citizens, that does not listen or educate themselves when our sciences and technologies warrant change, in a course or in course, or to listen to our enforcement officers who do not want to execute a failed policy and prosecute the nonviolent citizens of New Hampshire. Please act when all other elected officials who say they are for freedom idly sit back and do nothing to, uh, to remedy a failure in our government. There is a great civil war that is being waged on each and every individual in the United States. New Hampshire is among its participants. This war pits family against family, patient versus doctor users and supporters against law enforcement, and more importantly, our own individual freedoms against our representative governments, either federal, state, or local. Before you is HB 1705, oh, yeah, is 1705, which is a bill to tax and regulate cannabis, its sales and production for adults 21 years of age and older. The civil war that many New Hampshire residents willingly and unwillingly play in has a cost. This cost is not only measurable in dollars and cents, but is measurable in action and non-action. HB 1705 can help to answer and solve many issues that many fiscal and social conservatives, law enforcement agencies, Democrats, parents, and residents of New Hampshire have with respect to legalizing cannabis for adults. While it is true that alcohol is legal drug sold in New Hampshire, parents, law enforcement, and politicians alike seem to agree that New Hampshire regulates the sales, enforcing strict age requirements in place of where alcohol is sold. HB 1705 strictly requires the sale of cannabis to be sold only in tobacco stores that do not sell alcohol, not mixed in the two. <coughs> must be presented, and if a store does not sell to, or does sell to us a minor, actions such as loss of permit or other fines are attributable. Now, let's look at the current sale model for a typical drug dealer. He or she does not check ID, no age is too young, and there's no way to protect its users from harmful, harmful chemicals and other irritants that may uh, that could have been avoided by a well-regulated regu law such as HB 1705. Parents of youth who have used have no way of knowing where, what, or who sold, sold cannabis to their kids, adding to the hysteria. This bill protects the most vulnerable, our children and our residents who are sick. Take, for example, New Hampshire nurse Patricia Smith, who a few years ago was arrested for growing cannabis for a mentally ill 25-year-old daughter. The bill of this, such as the one we are discussing today, was in effect. Mrs. Smith's daughter and many more patients would have a better avenue of getting this much, uh, much needed medicinal research uh, remedy. Uh, if I can add to, I, I moved here from Michigan uh, about six months ago, which is a medical marijuana state. And I can tell you right now that the federal government is gonna do whatever they possibly can do to come into the state of New Hampshire and to tell us what we can and can't do. Now it is upon you folks to determine whether or not they should do that or should they not do that. They're gonna to try to do everything they possibly can. They're gonna create position white papers. They're gonna have police chief association, just like how we had before, come in and talk to you about the illegalities and the federal doctrine. The Commerce Clause is what's in effect. It created the Controlled Substance Act in 1970, and that is what actually is being really, really hammered down on everybody's throats. The problem with this with this law, or the good thing about this law, is that it creates it in the state in the state of New Hampshire, and it bypasses the intrastate commerce clause. And it's not interstate, but it's intrastate. And only New Hampshire can regulate what happens in New Hampshire. Now, regarding Representative Jasper's comments regarding that we need to build coalitions for states in order to uh, attack or talk to the federal government regarding this, I don't really see that as, as as a good thought process. 
New Hampshire was the very first state in, or the very first colony when the Declaration of Independence was created, signed, and delivered to England. That it, and while he was waiting for the response back from Mother England, the, the, the representatives, the, the folks who were the leaders at that time here in New Hampshire, took it among themselves to put their heads on the chopping block to create a constitution that was derived to protect the individual freedoms and liberties of its citizens. Not just the United States as a whole, its perspective of possible creation of its country, but for its own citizens. How remarkable is that for the leaders of that time period to take it amongst themselves to determine that for the safety of their own citizens, that they need to act when others, unfortunately, were unwilling to do in such a time period. Sure, could you just stick to the mic? Sure, definitely. So, anyway, in, in my closing, I just want to say thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you guys can do the honorable thing, and this does create a bunch of uh, parameters, legalities, and the procedures uh, create solutions for uh, cannabis reform. Any questions for this? Yes. <coughs> Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. I do have, uh, can I give this a second? <coughs> Absolutely. <coughs> and that works going down. Every West. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me here today, and, and thank you for the committee for having this dialogue. It's a very important issue. Um, I hear a lot of you talking about protecting your children, um, and I, I get to see a, a child of New Hampshire speak here today, so I think I can bring a, a special perspective to the table. Um, speaking, well, I think we need to be clear what this bill is. It's not an endorsement of the use or the consumption of marijuana. Um, it is an attempt to regulate and tax and control a commodity and a trade that has been going on in our communities for decades and decades and decades, whether we would like to admit it or not. Speaking to you as someone who cannot legally purchase alcohol, speaking to you as someone who really stands nothing to gain from this bill that were signed into law because my uh, uh, choice to use this substance would still be criminal, um, and most importantly, speaking to you as someone who has seen very dear friends and family members of mine profoundly affected by the underground black market of this trade. I would strongly encourage you to support this bill. Um, again, not because of your personal opinion on this matter, um, but as a pragmatic one and an understanding that supporting uh, regulation of something does not mean you, you support its use. Um, you want to protect your children, ladies and gentlemen, and that is a very um, admirable goal, um, as I'm sure my parents want to protect me. And speaking on behalf of your children, um, I would like to ask you a, a question in closing. Um, are you going to turn your backs on us? Are you going to continue a policy that has failed us and has failed this country? Or are you going to allow the laws of this country to grow up with us and ultimately make us safe? Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions or discourse? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Carl McNeil. Uh, Kurt Crown McNeil. Yes. Colonel. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I have several of uh, names here that uh, represent yeah. the common sense. If you all have similar testimony, uh, I would appreciate it if you keep the remarks brief and just, you know, you're in opposition or in favor of it, if, if everybody's going to say the same thing. Okay? Fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't pretend to speak for everybody who might have written that down on their card. Um, however, my name is Kirk McNeil, and I am the Executive Director of Manager Common Sense. We do advocate for sensible reform of drug policies here in the New Hampshire. Uh, I will be very brief in this regard. This particular bill regulates marijuana as a substance in a very similar fashion to the way that we currently regulate alcohol and cigarettes. The state of New Hampshire and representatives on this committee believe that we have the right, the need, and the reason to regulate the purchase of cigarettes to regulate the purchase of tobacco in general, to regulate the purchase of alcohol, particularly liquor that we sell in our state liquor stores, then it confuses me that we wouldn't consider a law that would allow us to regulate tax the 
distribution and sale of small amounts of marijuana, as this bill does. I am, um, I think amused is the right word. When I listen to the arguments of law enforcement, they, they seem to have a feeling that we don't realize the drug war is a dramatic failure. It doesn't work. One of the reasons that the THC content of marijuana is much higher than it used to be is the same as the reason why America went from being a beer drinking nation before prohibition to being a liquor drinking nation <coughs> afterwards. It's easier to move more potent things in smaller packages. If you want to control the use of marijuana, you regulate it and tax it. To prohibit it puts its use and distribution in the hands of people who you consider to be criminals. And they don't listen to your laws anyway. Thank you very much. Any questions on this witness? Yes, ma'am. I just would uh, clarify. Um, you said you were <coughs> an executive director of... My, my title is executive director of New Hampshire Common Sense. Okay. And follow-up question? Yes. Could you tell me how many members you have? No, actually, I, we don't have a membership role or anything like that. We're a, uh, a nonprofit group that advocates for <coughs> reform of drug laws, but we don't have anything like membership dues or membership roles. <coughs> Currently, since marijuana is an illegal drug, I would keep membership roles even if we have. Any, any other questions of this witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Patricia Smith. <coughs> Um, my name is Patricia Smith, and I'm a victim of the longest war in American history. I've had the privilege of caring for people as a registered nurse for over 30 years of my life. I actually graduated from Concord Hospital School of Nursing in 1975. I was arrested for growing marijuana in November 2009. I grew my own for medical reasons and for my daughter who has bipolar. After 30 years, a nursing, I have a cumulative damage to my back, the chronic lower back pain, and I chose marijuana instead of addicting pharmaceutical painkillers. I recently lost my appeal based on law enforcement violating my privacy as they were 30 feet from the back wall of my house, looking through my window. I'll soon be going to prison, and my sentence was two to four years with its $10,000 fine. I was told that my sentencing, that, this, that where I grew there, when I was not Manchester or Nashua, and that <coughs> they had to make an example of me. I have endured two years of slow torture since my arrest. I have been prosecuted by the federal and state government, including forfeiture in my home. I had to pay $51,000 to keep my home. I had to pay over $24,000. I'm financially and emotionally depleted. And right now I feel like this will never end. Marijuana should be legalized. Adults should have the right to the benefit from marijuana, which is less harmful than alcohol, pharmaceutical drugs, tobacco, or even coffee. I would like you to stop this war on our people lives like mine, a normal, decent person, are being destroyed, and this is harmful to all of our society. The laws are antiquated and severe and more harmful to our society than the plants that I see. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you have written testimony. No, I just wrote that, what I wanted to say. You'll take it, You'll take it if you want to leave it. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, I'm just curious about, because you grew it or whatever for your daughter, and I feel bad for whatever, but was there anything that you couldn't get medically oh, yes. that would help Not, well, in, in any way? She did take pharmaceutical drugs, and they were terrible, terrible side effects. She was dull and she had par paroxysmal, um, I can't describe it to you, it's medical. She had side effects from them that, and, and she did not want to take them, okay, and she was not going to take them, and she insisted that um, marijuana helped, 
and it did help her, kept her condition. And if, and if you know anything about bipolar, it's, um, it's actually devastating when they're manic as well as when they're depressed because when they're manic, they don't recognize danger. They kind of feel in, invulnerable and they'll do all kinds of things that you would never expect and you know, that are life threatening. Aside from standing over a bridge and, and contemplating suicide when they're depressed. And you know, marijuana has a lot of medical uses that the government does not want to admit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking the question. Um, from past experience, can you <clears throat> tell us the difference between taking a painkiller long term and the effects or the loss of effects it can create compared to taking marijuana long term? Pharmaceutical drugs can lead to all kinds of side effects, liver damage. Um, you obviously can't operate in a machine or you know, in your they fell in the and um, I you know, they're much more habit for me. You know, when I was arrested, after I was arrested, obviously I suddenly stopped smoking marijuana and I had no side effects. Oh, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. Um, from past experience. The intent of the, my question was, yes. and publishing there was more clear, does the taking of medical marijuana have a lasting effect in reducing your pain compared to if you took uh, prescription medication long term? Whereas like Vicodin, right. Vicodin after time, if you take it long term, the effects diminish. The oh. body becomes immune to it, would you believe? I actually don't know because you know, I made the choice based on my experience and nursing and seeing people being addicted to painkillers that I just didn't want to go that route. And, um, you know, I wouldn't um, smoke until the end of the day when my pain had gotten, you know, <coughs> severe and I would just smoke like half a joint or a joint and I would be fine and, and you know, be able to go to bed and, and sleep through the night. I'm just trying to figure out the medical marijuana. Is different compared to a prescription medication. Does it wear off, wear off at all, long term using it? I, I think people can develop some um, resistance and maybe need more. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Would you feel more comfortable having your daughter smoke marijuana or take a pharmaceutical over the long term? I smoke marijuana. She's a, no, she's an intelligent person. She's a, she has a, a degree. And, um, she, she doesn't want to take either. Representative Field, this one, you know, when your daughter had all this, and we were talking about the bill about they can sell one ounce in a store. How many ounces of that in order to help your daughter get it take for her to feel better? Um, I don't know. Well, yeah, she would only smoke it two or three times a week. So, but how many ounces? Um, you for, and I was know? I was smoking roughly one ounce a month, roughly. So I would say half an ounce, possibly, for her a month. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nick Murray. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve, member of the committee, thanks for having me today. Uh, a lot of my points have already been made, but I wanted to bring my perspective as a, a UNH student uh, to this debate. Um, I've seen through my high school career that, uh, as we've heard earlier, marijuana is readily easeable, easy to, uh, to obtain for high school students, uh, way, uh, much more so than alcohol. Um, and because of this, we, uh, we, have a, we have a legal barrier between uh, this, this, Ill, this legal market for adults and an illegal market, which is sometimes taken over by drug gangs uh, that use their, use their power through young people in school. Um, obviously, our society has no problem with distinguishing different behaviors for adults and children, as we do, our state does, with alcohol. Um, 
but what we see in our our uh, our schools is that the young people have taken over, you know, high school high school or high school age kids have taken over the sale and distribution of marijuana throughout society, bringing it closer to them. So how do we fix this problem? We go after the students and we arrest them, meaning that they have a hard time getting into college, or if they're already in college, they're losing their financial aid, losing their future for pursuing a productive life. Um, this this policy. Uh, is, is keeping our children locked in this cycle of uh, prohibition and crime where it, sh where, it should have no pro where it should have no place. If we want to protect our, ch where we know, if we want to protect our, our, our children in high school and uh, establish our state sovereignty, we need to support this bill and make sure that the marijuana trade is kept out of our high schools and into the regulated market where legal, law-abiding adults, uh, business owners, established uh, members of the community can sell it in a regulated fashion. The reason why uh, marijuana is so more easily accessible for high schoolers than alcohol is because of the storefront and the legal barrier there for a, uh, a legal ID to purchase. It makes, a, it makes a big difference. Thank you very much. Any questions? How would you regulate, say, how many ounces a person a day? They say, well, you can buy an ounce a day. How are they going to regulate if I got 20 friends to go in and buy an ounce a piece and then go back out and sell it to somebody else? How is that going to be regulated? I, I personally am not the one to ask. I didn't offer the bill, um, but I, I, I don't. I wouldn't see that as a problem because I, uh, people who already have the desire to use marijuana today are using it outside of the legal uh, framework. Um, as far as that goes, I mean, people can obtain as much as they want today. No matter uh, you know if the state regulates or not, so I think that that's something to ask the bill sponsor. But uh, well, what do you feel? Is that a follow up? Yeah. Okay. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, wouldn't you think that that would make it easier for the for the ones that don't want to go by laws to go in and send people in to buy a bunch of it? And you go somewhere else and sell it and make a lot of money. Well, we do have. We, there is. I mean, that that happens with alcohol today. But there, are, there's provisions there are laws that punish those who supply minors with alcohol. The same would apply here. This. Is, I mean, we're we're talking about a, a market regulated similar similar to alcohol. That those over the age who are providing alcohol to minors would be subject to prosecution, which is which is the right way to do it. We want to protect our kids by keeping the illegal market out of our high schools and out of our our young people's hands to distribute and punish those who provide it to them. We're not. We're we're avoiding. We're avoiding this whole problem by making it all illegal, keeping it under prohibition, making sure that legal, law-abiding adults cannot distribute this. We're putting it into the hands of our high schoolers and our and our college students, who then are introduced to this life of crime so so early and so and are are, are so readily uh, you know readily accessible to this to this this life that we don't we don't want in our society. We want our we want our kids to grow up. Realizing that the law is, is what it is, and, and we will per, we will participate in our in the marketplace legally. This is this is something that establishes from the very beginning of your schooling that working outside the law to make money is okay, and it's a very popular thing, obviously, in our society. That's not going away anytime soon. So I I, I don't think that we're going to fix this problem without taking prohibition away and taking it out of the hands of high schoolers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my questions. Would you agree that within UNH, that alcohol consumption is, is more highly associated with sexual assaults and violent crime compared to six people in a room smoking marijuana? I, I would agree, and I think that if you ask the uh, UNH Police Department, um, the Durham Police Department, and the uh, Health Services Department at UNH, they would tell you the same thing. They would say that more sexual assaults are committed under the youth, under the influence of alcohol. I don't know this exact uh, numbers, but I know that the Health Services Department at the University of New Hampshire will have those numbers for you, and they they give those out. They 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 make that available to students, showing that alcohol use can be dangerous, especially when you know when it can lead to these these sorts of uh, more violent things. Marijuana. You, you ask the police, the, the police chief. I I personally asked the you know, the. Paul Dean, the police at UNH, that he says that he sees way more violence and way more trouble with uh, people under the influence of alcohol than under the influence of marijuana. It's a, it's a fact. It's a physical and medical fact. Representative uh, Jasper. I understand UNH has a fairly strict substance abuse policy. Uh, 
Would you have any trouble procuring marijuana on UNH campus? I, I, if, if I chose to find it on campus, I could easily find it. I know many people that uh, are, you know, have, have, have had the opportunity to find it very easily. Uh, even those I'm going to be, uh, you know, even those uh, that, you know, don't seek it out would find it pretty easily just because it's, that's the only way you can find it. It's the only market that's, that's in our schools. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bob Constantine. Good afternoon. It's been a long time. My name is Bob Constantine. I just founded something, an organization called Marijuana Just Say No. That's K N O W. I'm representing the 21 and a half million people that uh, have been arrested since 1965 in cannabis related uh, crimes. I think it's interesting to note before I get into something, and I'll be brief. All of the detractors today are paid to be anti freedom here. Um, they're using a lot of rhetoric from years ago, um, and they're saying how they feel but they're very, very uh, slim on uh, actual stats and so forth. Um, speaking of prohibitions, uh, in 1988, Judge Francis Young, he's a DEA judge, there was a petition to reschedule uh, cannabis. He stated that nearly all medicines have toxic, potentially lethal effects, but marijuana is not such a substance. There is no record describing a proven documented cannabis-induced fatality. He also stated, I won't read the whole thing, he said, this again, it's a DEA judge, in strict medical terms, marijuana is far safer than many foods we commonly consume. For example, eating 10 raw potatoes can result in a toxic response. By comparison, it is physically impossible to eat enough marijuana to induce death. Marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically, therapeutically active substances known to man. By any measure of rational analysis, marijuana can be safely used within a supervised routine <coughs> medical care. I'll submit that. Again, that's from a DEA judge in 1985. <coughs> Speaking to whether marijuana causes cancer, well, you shouldn't just believe me. You should go to the American Medical Association Journal, which published something just a couple weeks ago, January 10th, 2012, um, stating that it does not. You could also go to the Archives of Internal Medicine, the Yale School of Medicine posted something there in 2007 stating cannabis smoke exposure is not associated with airflow obstruction or emphysema. Or you could go to Donald Tashkin. He's a doctor at UCLA. He's the one that the prohibitionists used to like to trot out all of his reports. But here's what he came up with. He said what we found instead of cancer causing was no association at all and even a suggestion of some protective effect. You should also note that cannabis isn't always consumed by smoking it. It can be eaten, there's tinctures, and it can be vaporized. Concerning the gateway effect, I won't belabor that, but there are studies recently done here in New Hampshire. University of New Hampshire did a study <coughs> saying there's no gateway effect. The University of Pittsburgh, these are government schools. Uh, also, somebody mentioned it earlier about uh, how dangerous marijuana is compared to other substances. Well, tobacco is the most dangerous substance, according to U.S. Surgeon General reports. Alcohol, which you might note the state of New Hampshire sells $534 million worth of alcohol last year. That's the second leading cause of death. Um, you go all the way down through caffeine, 10,000 people or so die annually from caffeine, and cannabis is zero. So I'm here to refute all of uh, what you heard and what you may hear after me. It's baloney. Uh, as far as uh, the whether it's a legitimate question, apparently the American public feels that it is because for four years running, it's been the number one question. When Obama came out and said, I want to be open and ask me some questions, uh, the internet questions that he got, uh, the number one question was, what are you going to do to legalize cannabis? And he's denied it so far. About 97 and a half people per hour in the United States get arrested for cannabis-related crimes. 
That's a lot of people. That's why we have the most people in this country in jail of any other country in the world. Most of these people have never hurt anyone. I know. I'm one of them. Um, I will echo, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Van Wickler said something about, um, or somebody mentioned something about uh, Article 7. I think it was actually uh, Tim Comerford. Article 7 um, in New Hampshire is the one that deals with state sovereignty. You should also check out Article 2 in the New Hampshire Constitution. That's natural rights. That basically says, in a lot of words, you own yourself. Nobody else owns you. If you don't hurt anyone, you own yourself. Somebody mentioned, I think it was Article 10, the United States Constitution. Check that one out, but also check out Article 9. The federal government doesn't really even have the granted power to prevent anyone from ingesting anything. They grabbed it. And it's because, essentially, states have wimped out that they've just got picked on. I find it very ironic. We're talking about alcohol and children. Go up to Bristol, New Hampshire. There's a little strip mall. State liquor store here. Daycare facility here. Kind of funny. Um, I'm willing to bet also that none of you in this room have ever seen the published controlled New Hampshire drug schedule. The New Hampshire controlled drug schedule, the way it's supposed to be published. It's supposed to be published in a newspaper. I'm willing to bet none of you have ever seen it because it doesn't exist. It was supposed to happen. The Commissioner of Health and Human Services of this state is supposed to do that. If you look at statutory construction, your RSA 2132, you might want to write that down. You can hear more about this. Um, I filed the 91A request. Uh, I was kind of busy preparing for my own defense. Um, but I took the time to file that. He never showed over here at Merrimack County Superior Court. In the judge's decision, he verified that no local schedule exists. Well, what's the significance of that? How are people supposed to know what's legal and illegal if the commissioner of Health and Human Services doesn't even follow the law that he's supposed to follow to publish what's on this list? We'll get into that a little more, but um, trust me. As far as the substance goes, there's no question in my mind <laughs> that cannabis, I'm not advocating people to use it, but it's fairly benign. Far less dangerous than many things out there that are legal. But there's another question I'd like to raise. I'd ask every one of you, who owns your body? If the state can sell $534 million worth of something that's technically poison, and then prohibit you from ingesting something that's been declared medicine, not just by the 16 states that have medical marijuana, not just by Washington, D.C., by the federal government themselves. I'm going to submit to you in my testimony the United States patent for cannabis. It says it's patent number 6,630,000 something, something, something. Cannabinoids is antioxidants and neuroprotectives. I'll put that in. So they patented it. I don't know if there's any prohibitionists left here, but I would like to extend an invitation to any of them um, to have an open <coughs> and rational debate. Um, I'd be willing to participate any time, any place, um, because I know this is limited, and I know you've heard a lot of testimony, so I'm open to questions at this point. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you ever written testimony? Oh, yeah, and um, if I could, I would like to be able to email. There's all kinds of stuff that's out there that we refuse everything you're doing from the prohibition. Just what you have with you today. Sure. Thank you. 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 Any other comments? Anybody else wish to speak? Okay. Hearing for 1705 SNA is. Yeah, that's exactly.